I will uh, dress for action. Um, okay, uh, before I start, uh, let me point out uh, that I put my uh, <coughs> email address up on the screen. Uh, it's been my experience that sometimes people are reluctant to ask questions or uh, questions occur after the talk. So anybody who wants to contact me to ask questions, uh, I monitor my email regularly. Uh, today's topic is uh, the persistence of moral disagreement. And I want to start by introducing a concept uh, that I'm going to be treating as a technical term, uh, which I'll call fundamental moral disagreement. And that's going to be the focus of much of what I have to say today. Right, so uh, to begin, nobody doubts that moral views differ both within cultural groups uh, and across cultural groups. Uh, but uh, the question we're going to be confronting is whether that diversity would persist under idealized circumstances. And that is a hotly debated topic. Uh, equally hotly debated is just how those idealized circumstances uh, should be characterized. Uh, that itself is a contentious issue. Part of the answer to that question, I think, is clear enough if you look at the literature. Uh, that an ideally situated person in asking this question is somebody who is rational and impartial uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, people are, uh, <clears throat> at least a, a disagreement is under idealized circumstances uh, if people are <clears throat> party to the disagreement agree on all the, non, all, all the relevant non-moral facts. Uh, but of course, even here, uh, there's still lots of philosophical work to be done because those notions themselves are uh, hotly contested. And I'll come back very briefly, particularly to the rationality one a little bit later on. But for the most part, given the constraints of time, I'll be assuming uh, that we have a reasonable, informal grasp of uh, these ideas. All right, so if a moral disagreement would in fact persist under idealized circumstances, I'm going to say, again, as a technical term, that it's fundamental. And if it would not persist under idealized circumstances, I'll say that the agreement is superficial, uh, <clears throat> again, using this as a technical term. Uh, well, there are lots of philosophical reasons why the question of fundamental uh, moral disagreement uh, is important. And I'll focus on two in this talk. But again, if there were more time, uh, I could add three or four or five more. Uh, the two I'll focus on grow out of two very different traditions in meta-ethics and moral theory. First tradition, uh, the ideal observer, or what I'll sometimes call the qualified attitude uh, tradition. And the second, contemporary moral realism. So let me start with the ideal observer uh, and qualified attitude tradition. Uh, arguably, uh, this was the kind of view defended by important 18th century historical figures like Adam Smith, David Hume, uh, Francis Hutchinson. And unquestionably, it's the kind of view, it's of course a family of views, uh, that was defended uh, by some major figures in 20th century uh, moral theory, uh, Rod Firth, Richard Brandt, David Lewis, Gil Harmon, and others. Uh, the view, uh, like all families of views, comes in a variety of flavors. Uh, let me just gesture at two ways you might unpack uh, these uh, ideal observer stories. So one is a semantic story, classic meta-ethics. Meta-ethics uh, has the job of, among other things, giving us the meaning of moral claims. So as a semantic story, uh, the ideal observer story says X is morally right or wrong, uh, means that anyone who's ideally situated, that is to say who's rational and impartial and fully informed, would have a favorable or unfavorable attitude toward X. Okay? Now, of course, uh, if ideally situated people disagree about X, then X is neither right nor wrong. So this semantic version of the ideal observer theory, uh, along with fundamental disagreement, leads to moral skepticism, or what's sometimes called moral nihilism. Okay? Another version uh, that you can also find in the literature, or called the justification version, it says that a moral claim is justified if the person making the claim would have the appropriate positive or negative attitude uh, toward the matter at hand after going through an appropriate idealizing process, where again the goal of that process is to correct relevant false beliefs, remove partiality, uh, remove irrationality, and so on. 
Uh, and in this case, if two ideally situated people have different attitudes about X, uh, then X is wrong, for example, will be justified for one, while X is not wrong, is going to be justified for the other. So this version of the ideal observer theory, along with fundamental disagreement, leads to moral relativism. Okay, uh, so, so much for the relevance of fundamental disagreement to uh, the ideal observer tradition. How about moral realism? Well, what I particularly have in mind here is contemporary moral realism defended by, well, a very large number of important philosophers, Dick Boyd, David Brink, uh, uh, Peter Railton, Michael Smith, Smith Nick Sturgeon, and, and others. Uh, there are, of course, important differences amongst these theorists, uh, but there's something on which they agree. Uh, what they agree on is that the persistence of moral disagreement that doesn't depend on non-moral disagreement, uh, that can't be traced to non-moral disagreement or other distorting factors, would pose a significant problem for their theories. And rather than argue that myself, let me just quote what they say to you. Uh, so Richard Boyd, possibly to be considered the uh, uh, sort of grandfather of contemporary, what is called in the United States, Cornell version moral realism, Boyd says, careful philosophical examination will reveal that agreement on non-moral issues would eliminate almost all disagreement about the sorts of issues which arise in ordinary moral practice. David Brink, it's incumbent on the moral realist to claim that most moral disputes are resolvable, at least in principle. Michael Smith, the notion of objecti objectivity signifies the possibility of convergence in moral views. So, uh, what I want to leave you with uh, in this very brief glimpse at moral realism uh, is that uh, most moral realists, and indeed most anti-realists, most of their philosophical opponents, in fact agree that fundamental moral disagreement, disagreement that would persist under idealized circumstances, either entails or at least strongly suggests that moral realism is false. Now, one quick footnote here, in the last five or eight years, uh, there has been a branch of the moral realist religion uh, which denies this, the so-called non-convergentists, people like uh, Russ Schaefer Landau. I'm going to be ignoring the non-convergentists here. In the discussion, if you want, we can take that up. I think their arguments are singularly implausible, but this isn't the time to debate with them. So I'm mostly debating with uh, the major central figures of uh, moral realism, contemporary moral realism. All right, so what I've done so far is given you a bunch of reasons, and there are others that I don't have time for, why it's, I, I think, fundamentally important for philosophy to know whether uh, <clears throat> a fundamental, whether moral disagreement is fundamental or superficial. Okay? And what I want to do now uh, is turn to the empirical evidence start looking at some relevant data. Uh, and what I'm going to do is, um, again, there's a lot of data out there, but I'm going to look at three, uh, as it were, projects, uh, at two um, uh, preceding our work, and then tell you a little bit about some of our recent work. Uh, so there'll be three bodies of data that I'll be looking at in the next few minutes. Uh, first of all, the work of Richard Brandt, uh, who is arguably the first experimental philosopher, at least in the modern tradition. Um, he made his mistakes. He, for example, offered me my first job. Mm -hmm. uh, but apart from that, uh, a quite admirable figure in this area. Uh, and here's the way Brandt got started in this. So as I, I suppose most of you know, uh, in the anthropological literature, going all the way back to Westermark in the early years of the 20th century, perhaps even earlier than that, there's plenty of evidence documenting divergent moral outlooks in different cultures. But traditional ethnography gives us little guidance on what would happen to that moral disagreement under idealized circumstances, particularly, of course, when one of the non-idealizing circumstances sitting off in the background are the religious and or metaphysical views of the people being studied in the ethnography. Well, in the early 1950s, uh, Brandt began a study of the Hopi Indians in the American Southwest, 
with the very explicit goal uh, of, and Brandt, by the way, is a moral philosopher, for those of you who don't know, uh, so he went out and taught himself, or tried to teach himself, the methods of ethnography. Uh, and his goal was to provide the kind of ethnography that would, in fact, address the concerns uh, of moral philosophers. Well, what Brandt found, uh, reported in his book, published, I think, in the early 60s, maybe the late 50s, uh, his book called Hopi Ethics, uh, is that there are, in fact, a number of uh, very notable moral differences between the Hopis of that period and white Americans of that period that Brandt couldn't trace to non-moral sources. Uh, the example that everybody talks about, the most famous of these, uh, is that the Hopi children uh, used to adopt small animals, typically birds, but sometimes other small animals, as pets. And they played very roughly with these pets. Uh, the pets typically ended up with broken bones after a day or two and rarely survived more than three or four days. There was nothing confidential or secret about that. It was done right in the middle of the village. Everybody knew what was happening. Uh, and uh, Brandt uh, was sort of, uh, you know, with his uh, <clears throat> middle-class white American sensibilities, quite shocked by the appalling treatment uh, accorded to these small animals. Uh, well, he looked for, uh, he, by the way, he asked the uh, Hopi elders, uh, you know, do you know this is going Of course we know it's going on, right? It's right there in front of us. Uh, well, is this okay? And they looked at, of course it's okay. What's the problem? Well, so Brandt, uh, first of all, said, yes, there's a moral disagreement. Is it a superficial disagreement? Could it, in fact, depend on some non-moral disagreement? And he worked remarkably hard at trying to find a non-moral disagreement, uh, but couldn't succeed. So, for example, here's the first idea here that, uh, naturally, what would a philosopher think of? Maybe the Hopi are intuitive Cartesians, uh, right? They think humans are conscious, but animals are automata. And uh, so, you know, it doesn't matter if you break the parts off an automaton, particularly if it's a cheap automaton found out in the forest, okay, well, in the desert. Uh, but no, uh, he asked the Hopi about this, uh, and they thought he was mad, quite yeah, Of course the animals feel pain. Uh, indeed, they probably feel pain more sensitively than humans, I hope he thought. Well, he tried lots of ideas. He even went so far as to think, well, maybe they think it's okay to torture the birds because these animals uh, <clears throat> who suffer martyrdom are rewarded for their martyrdom uh, like St. Sebastian uh, in the afterlife. And he asked the Hopi about that, and the Hopi looked at him as though he were insane uh, and explained to him, no, uh, that's not uh, <clears throat> the case. Uh, and he tried a, a, a large array of other possibilities uh, and could find uh, nothing uh, that would suggest that the disagreement at the moral level was rooted in a disagreement and uh, on a non-moral question. Uh, so Brandt tentatively, uh, he grants that uh, this is hardly conclusive, but he tentatively concludes that these moral disagreements are fundamental, uh, that they reflect what he called a basic difference in attitude that wouldn't, in fact, disappear under his own favored version uh, of the ideal observer theory, which he called the qualified attitude theory. He went on to argue that his own version of the qualified attitude theory, or of the ideal observer theory, uh, because of these empirical facts, did, in fact, lead to relativism. And he argued that other versions of the ideal observer theory leads to lead to skepticism. All right, there's case study number one. Uh, case number, study number two I want to talk to you about a little bit. Uh, I'm sure many of you know something about uh, is the wonderful work uh, by Dick Nisbet and his uh, associates, particularly Doug Cohen, on cultures of honor. Because although Nisbet and his associates weren't, in fact, motivated by the philosophical question, I think their findings uh, and their very careful methodology uh, provides important evidence on this question of, is moral disagreement fundamental? Much of what I'm going to be talking about, by the way, is summarized uh, in uh, this uh, delightful book. I'll, I'll come back to it in, in a minute or two. I think in many ways, it's a paradigm of how to do interdisciplinary cognitive science. Uh, Cultures of Honor was published about 10 years ago, I think. 
All right, well, let me tell you a little bit about cultures of honor to get started. It's a complicated phenomenon, but for our purposes, we'll, we can focus on just one aspect of the phenomenon. Here's what Nisbet and Cohen tell us. They say a key aspect of, culture, of the culture of honor is the importance placed on the insult and the necessity to respond to it. An insult implies that the target is weak enough to be bullied. Since a reputation for strength is of the essence in the culture of honor, the individual who, ins who insults someone must be forced to retract. If the instigator refuses, he must be punished with violence or even death. Well, one of the things uh, that is, was independently known uh, from the anthropological literature is that cultures of honor tend to arise. In fact, cultures of this sort have arisen all over the world uh, in particular situations, namely situations where uh, resources are liable to theft and the state or the community's uh, coercive apparatus uh, is insufficiently strong to prevent people uh, from uh, uh, having their resources stolen or to punish the thief. Now, these conditions arise uh, under a number of circumstances. Uh, perhaps the most widely discussed uh, is in relatively remote areas where herding is the main form of viable agriculture. Uh, and of course, it's the, as it were, portability of herd animals. Uh, very easy to steal a goat or a camel, uh, uh, a lot harder to steal an olive grove. Okay. Uh, so the portability of herd animals makes them prone to theft, and the remoteness uh, makes it difficult for uh, the police, if there are any, to uh, punish the thieves. But uh, <clears throat> cultures of honor also typically arise in urban inner city areas. Uh, notoriously, uh, many of the black ghettos in the United States uh, are, in fact, uh, or are characterized by cultures of honor. Many of the same features you see in traditional cultures of honor arise uh, quite independently in those settings. Well, an important feature about cultures of honor, uh, and uh, I think a crucially interesting one, not only for our purposes, but for other purposes as well, things that have nothing to do with our topic today, uh, but have, have to do with cultural evolution, is that cultures of honor uh, exhibit remarkable cultural inertia. They tend to persist for generations after the conditions that gave rise to them disappear. So after people, for example, stop being anything like herders. And uh, what Nisbet and Cohen argue in that Cultures of Honor's book is that uh, the American South, or at least parts in particular, parts of the white population of the American South to this day, or to 10 years ago when the work was done, uh, are in fact Cultures of Honor. Well, the American South was originally settled by Scotch-Irish herders uh, <clears throat> who had a long tradition of culture of honor. And uh, <clears throat> as I say, Nisbet and Cohen uh, devote much of their book to defending the case uh, that a culture of honor persists among white Southerners today. <clears throat> uh, and it's here, uh, I said earlier, I thought this was uh, an ideal example of how interdisciplinary work in the cognitive sciences should be done. Uh, let me say a little bit about the kinds of evidence that they marshal because they do a, I think, spectacularly good job of marshaling evidence from a wide variety of disciplines, including demographic data uh, that indicate that amongst uh, Southern whites, homicides are more common uh, <clears throat> in regions where herding was once itself common. Okay? Also, white males in the South are much more likely than white males in other regions to be involved in homicides resulting from arguments, but interestingly, they're not more likely to be involved in homicides resulting from uh, 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 robberies or other sorts of felonies. Uh, so the take home message if you're traveling in the American South here is don't diss a white guy, uh, right? You're no more likely in the South than in the North to be shot in the, in the stick up of a convenience store but you diss a white guy, uh, you insult the white guy, uh, <clears throat> you may get your head blown off. Okay, they also look at survey data indicating that white Southerners are much more likely to believe claims like violence is extremely justified uh, <clears throat> in response to a variety of affronts. 
and uh, they're also much more likely to agree to claims like if a man fails to respond violently to an, to an insult, particularly an insult to his woman, uh, he is not much of a man. Okay? They also look at legal scholarship, uh, indicating that in the southern states, the laws uh, <clears throat> give uh, more freedom uh, for the use of violence uh, for people defending themselves uh, and their property. And particularly interesting, I think, is the work they, their own research, rather than merely their uh, assembly of data from pre-existing literature. Uh, and I'll only have time to tell you about two fascinating bits, uh, one a field study uh, and the other a series of lab experiments. In the field study, uh, letters were sent to hundreds of potential employers around the United States, both in the North and in the South. The letters purported to be job applications. They said, I'm moving to your area. I'm uh, writing to find out whether you have a job available for me. Uh, they purported to be from a 27-year-old Michigan man, uh, <clears throat> uh, it's an American state, uh, who had one blemish on his otherwise very solid record. Here is the way one version of the letter explained the blemish. I've been convicted of manslaughter. I got into a fight with someone who was having an affair with me, my fiancé. He confronted me in front of my friends at a bar, told everyone that he and my fiancé were sleeping together, laughed at me to my face, and asked me to step outside if I was man enough, and in the ensuing fight, uh, the other guy was killed. The other letter explained uh, that the applicant had stolen a couple of expensive cars at a time when his family uh, particularly needed money. Well, the southern employers that Nisbet and Cohen wrote to were much more likely to be sympathetic in response to the manslaughter incident than the car theft incident, but, uh, on car theft letter, but uh, there was no similar disparity in the northern employers. Uh, and just to give you some idea of what we're talking about in terms of, now these were independently coded and what have you, but here's one, I, here's one example of what it is to be sympathetic. Remember, this is somebody who uh, <clears throat> murdered somebody, sorry, killed somebody in a parking lot fight. Uh, as for your problems in the past, anyone could probably be in the situation you were in. It was just an unfortunate incident that should not be held against you. Your honesty shows you are sincere. I wish you the best of luck for the future. You have a positive attitude and a willingness to work. These are qualities that businesses look for in potential employees. Uh, no northern uh, uh, employer was anywhere nearly so sympathetic. OK, well, let me now tell you about the laboratory study. Uh, these were conducted on white, male, mostly upper middle class students, undergraduate students at the University of Michigan. Uh, and these students were some from the north and some from the south, so some culture of honor and some not, if this hypothesis is correct. So subjects were told initially, uh, we're going to take a saliva sample uh, to measure blood sugar before you perform a variety of tasks. So saliva sample is taken, then they walk down a long hall, and in this long, narrow hall, uh, there is a confederate a, a big football player who's trained to play this role, uh, and the Confederate bumps into the person, uh, you know, uh, apparently accidentally, uh, and then mumbles very loudly under his breath, asshole. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> after that, they get to the other end of the hall, a second saliva sample is taken, and the saliva samples are tested for cortisol, which is associated with stress, and for testosterone, uh, which is associated with dominance, behavior, and aggression. And this is one of my favorite slides ever. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the northern uh, non-culture of honor subjects uh, basically didn't react at all. Uh, and uh, the southerners had a surge of testosterone and a surge of cortisol. And we're talking now in seconds, uh, right? 30 seconds after the bumping. Well, I'm inclined to think that these findings suggest that moral attitudes about the appropriateness of violence in response to insults will not converge even under idealized circumstances, and that therefore these kinds of disagreements are in fact fundamental, in my terms, moral disagreements. To see why, I mean, the, the, the data don't immediately speak for themselves, since they weren't designed to test this hypothesis, uh, but consider some of the standard, what's often called in the literature, defusing explanations, explanations of 
uh, that could be used by a moral realist to argue, uh, yes, there's disagreement, but it's not really fundamental. Okay? Well, uh, one uh, kind of uh, disagreement, uh, one kind of move is that the disagreement is really caused or sustained by disagreement about relevant non-moral facts. Indeed, this is, the, uh, this is really the big weapon of the moral realist in trying to rebut cases like this. But in these cases, it's hard to see what those non-moral facts might be. In particular, the one that you might think of first, namely religious disagreements, we know to be false. Uh, there were no systematic religious differences between the northern population and the southern population. Uh, nor is there any reason to think, uh, you know, <clears throat> I mean, maybe this isn't a serious suggestion, but you know, could it be that the northerners don't know that being called an asshole uh, <clears throat> is an insult? No. Uh, <clears throat> although we don't have data for that, I'm, I'm just speculating. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, of course, it's always possible uh, that there is an unsuspected systematic difference in belief between these two populations. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> even the three or four or five uh, bits of data that Nisbet and Cohen assembled uh, don't begin to exhaust the possible uh, uh, disagreements that might be lurking there. But I think at this point, the burden of argument surely falls squarely on those who want to deny that the moral disagreements about the appropriateness of violence between culture of honor folks in the American South and non-culture of honor folks in the American North uh, is uh, <clears throat> people who want to, to deny that that disagreement is fundamental. Well, another diffusing explanation uh, that uh, <clears throat> might be suggested here is that one group or other fails to be impartial. Remember, it's uh, factual disagreement or non-moral disagreement, partiality uh, or irrationality. Those are the big three uh, in characterizing idealized circumstances. But uh, as John Doris and Alex Plackia say in a recent paper, uh, there seems no reason to think that the Southerners' economic interests are more served uh, or, or are served by being quick on the draw while Northerners', econ Northerners economic interests uh, are served by turning the other cheek. There looks to be no obvious partiality here. It looks to be the wrong notion to apply to. Well, what about irrationality? Could it be that one group or the other is irrational? Here, of course, we have a hotly contested notion. Uh, and in particular, uh, there are both thin and thick accounts of rationality. On a thin account of rationality, uh, and of course, spelling this out in detail is a major project, but on a thin account of rationality, it's tied to uh, logic, uh, probability, decision theory. So you are thinly rational to the extent that your belief formation and your decision making uh, coheres with the principles of logic, probability theory, statistics, decision theory. Thick rationality, on the other hand, uh, <clears throat> is a, a harder notion to characterize uh, but there are apparently, for, I don't believe there is such a thing as, as thick rationality. I think it's a, a confused notion. But the people who invoke this notion uh, think that there are certain kinds of preferences which, regardless of the reason for them, uh, are intrinsically irrational. Well, uh, it's, I think, singularly implausible that the Northerners and the Southerners uh, um, <clears throat> disagree on thin rationality, there's absolutely no reason to, to suspect that, they might, of course, disagree on thick, in, uh, you know, they, they might, of course, differ uh, <clears throat> on rationality if you have a thick interpretation of rationality, because, after all, Southerners voted for George Bush, uh, <laughs> and that indicates that they are obviously irrational. Uh, but, of course, uh, as this uh, example illustrates, uh, Thick interpretations of rationality are themselves normatively loaded. Uh, so in this debate, they're question begging. All right, so I told you I was going to tell you about three projects uh, in this part of the talk. And the third is some of the work uh, that I've been involved with, uh, with a gaggle of friends and collaborators. Because uh, John Doris is the main figure up there. Kai Ping Peng uh, is uh, the main person doing the work that I'll tell you about in China. Okay, uh, this work was inspired uh, by Nisbet's work, but not the culture of honor stuff, another branch of uh, what Nisbet is doing. Um, Nisbet, uh, in more recent work, uh, reports 
uh, or claims at least, uh, to have evidence that East Asian cultures, so EA is East Asian up there, East Asian cultures are more collectivist than Western W cultures, uh, which are more individualist. Uh, the East Asian conception of a person, according to Nisbet, but relying on a lot of other uh, very rich and significant literature, the work of Hazel Marcus uh, and Kitayama and others, uh, the East Asian conception of the person emphasizes the social role of that person, mother, teacher, and so on, and de-emphasizes context-independent attributes like being honest or gregarious. Right? This suggests, at least, that East Asians would take a harsher view of transgressions that are destructive of collective or group ties, and a more lenient view of transgressions that benefit or actions that benefit the group. So that was our motivation. Now note, if that's right, that is to say, if these psychological, deep psychological differences in one's conception of what it is to be a person or what's important uh, about being a person uh, have significant impact on moral judgments, then it's very plausible, I think, uh, that the resulting disagreement is fundamental. So I want to tell you about two experiments, um, or one or sets of experiments. Uh, one of them was carried out uh, entirely in English. The subjects were uh, <clears throat> students at the University of California at Berkeley, where Kaiping Peng is. Uh, some of them were Asian uh, <clears throat> Americans. Some of them were non-Asian Americans, uh, but uh, typically second, third generation in, or more in each case. Second experiment, uh, <clears throat> the Asians were Chinese Chinese, uh, that is to say uh, Chinese students uh, at, in, in Beijing and non-Asian undergraduates uh, at the University of California at Santa Cruz. And for this one, of course, the experimental material was translated into Chinese and then back translated and translated again if necessary. All right, so I'll tell you about three, uh, we actually use several more, but I'll tell you about three of the scenarios we looked at. Uh, this one, of course, is a classic uh, in the philosophical literature. Uh, we call it the magistrate and the mob. So let me read it to you quickly. An unidentified member of an ethnic group is known to be responsible for a murder that occurred in a town. This causes many of the townspeople to become extremely hostile towards the ethnic group. Because the town has a history of severe ethnic conflict and rioting, the town's police chief and judge know that if they do not immediately identify and punish a culprit, the townspeople will start anti-ethnic rioting that will cause a great deal of damage to property owned by members of the ethnic group and a considerable number of serious injuries and deaths in the ethnic population. But nobody in the community knows who the murderer is or where to find him. The police chief and the judge are faced with a dilemma. They can falsely accuse, convict, and imprison Mr. Smith, an innocent member of the ethnic group, in order to prevent the riots. Or they can continue hunting for the guilty man, thereby allowing the anti-ethnic riots to occur, and do the best they can to combat the riots until the guilty man is apprehended. After discussing and debating their options at length, the police chief and the judge decide to falsely accuse, convict, and imprison Mr. Smith, the innocent member of the ethnic group, in order to prevent the riots. They do so, thereby preventing the riots and preventing considerable number of ethnic group deaths and serious injuries. So, how many of you think the magistrate and the judge did the right thing? <laughs> um, well, let's see, how many of you are paraplegic and wouldn't raise your... All right, uh, not at all surprising, okay? Why is it not all surprising? Well, the Western, I stress Western, philosophical consensus on cases like this couldn't be more clear. Uh, here's a comment by Paul Bloom Bloomfield. Uh, Judges ought not to find the innocent guilty in order to prevent riots in the streets, period. And here is one of my favorite quotes. I'm, I'm sure many of you know it. In fact, uh, the challenge is, how does it end? I'll show you if you don't know. But someone who really thinks in advance that it's open to question whether such an action as procuring ju the judicial execution of the innocent is permissible should be quite excluded from consideration. I don't want to argue with him. Anybody knows the next, know the next line? No? 
He shows a corrupt mind, uh, and this is a quote from Elizabeth Anscombe in 1958, but even uh, adamant utilitarians like J.J.C. Smart uh, admit that cases like the magistrate and the mob are particularly problematic for them. But uh, in both experiment one and experiment two, uh, what we found is that the Asians are significantly less inclined to make the judgments that Bloomfield uh, and Anscombe take to be obvious. Uh, so I'm not going to go through this all in detail. It's a long study with lots of data. Uh, but let me just gesture at it. We asked uh, 20 questions uh, approximately of each subject about each scenario. Um, here are some of the moral questions. The police chief and the judge did the morally right thing, did the morally wrong thing, and so on. We also asked a bank of non-moral or factual questions uh, like uh, being falsely accused and convicted uh, in prison calls Mr. Smith to suffer, his family to suffer, and so on. Okay? What we found was that the Chinese are significantly less likely to think that the police chief and the judge, uh, <clears throat> what the police chief and the judge did was morally wrong. They are independently, uh, or quasi-independently since we asked these as separate questions, they're significantly more likely to think uh, what uh, the judge and the magistrate did or police chief did was morally right. They're significantly less likely to say that the police chief and the judge should be punished. And they're, uh, much more, they're significantly more likely to hold that the potential rioters are the ones responsible for the scapegoating, suggesting that they attribute moral responsibility at the level of the collective, much more so than their individualist counterparts in the West. All right, that's uh, probe number one. Here's probe number two the promiscuity case. Jack and Debbie have been happily married for 15 years. Jack's best friend from childhood, Casey, is passing through town on business. Jack and Debbie invite him to stay at their house for a few days. All three of them have a great time drinking, eating, laughing, and talking over old times. On the morning before Casey is scheduled to leave, Jack is called to work to deal with an emergency. Casey, old friend, Jack says, I'm sorry I won't be here to see you off but I want you to enjoy our fullest hospitality. Looking meaningfully at Debbie, Jack says, Debbie will be pleased to see to your every need, won't you, Debbie? The implication is clear. Jack is inviting Casey to have sex with his wife. After Jack leaves, Debbie and Casey have sex. <laughs> Here are some of the questions we asked. Uh, they're sort of the obvious ones, similar to the ones we asked before. The results. Chinese subjects are, again, significantly more likely to agree that this behavior is morally wrong, significantly less likely to agree that it's morally right. They were more likely to think that Jack should be punished for what he did. Uh, they were more likely to think that Jack should have been prevented from doing what he did. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, as we see it, these results uh, suggest, at least, that the Chinese subjects were more likely to think that sexual behavior uh, <clears throat> Uh, is appropriately morally condemned and subject to punitive responses uh, <clears throat> and legitimately interfered with, uh, which is the sort of thing that would be predicted by the Nisbet-inspired hypothesis that Chinese culture is more collectivist, since, after all, sexual behavior is intuitively, at least, a threat to the family, uh, which is among the more uh, important uh, forms of association in a collectivist culture. All right, third example. Jack and Debbie have been happily married for 15 years. Jack's best friend Casey from childhood is passing through town on business, and Jack and Debbie invite him to stay at their house for a few days. All three of them have a great time drinking, eating, laughing, and taking, talking over old times. On the morning, by the way, each uh, uh, participant got only one of these, so we're not you know, hitting them over the head with Jack and Debbie. Uh, <clears throat> On the morning before Casey is scheduled to leave, Jack is called to work to deal with an emergency. When he returns home a few hours later, he finds Debbie and Casey lying on the couch naked in each other's arms. They have obviously been having sex. Jack is enraged. His best friend and his wife have betrayed him. Bastard, he shouts at Casey. How can you insult a man like this when you are a guest in his home? Casey tries to respond, but before he can do anything, Jack pulls a knife, stabbing him and killing him. Okay. Subjects were asked many of the same questions, parallel questions, and uh, a few additional ones uh, <clears throat> of a of factual sort, uh, the obvious ones that you could uh, uh, add, uh, like these. 
The results. Chinese subjects uh, were less likely to think that the homicide committed by Jack was morally wrong, more likely to think it was morally right, less likely to think that Jack should be punished. Uh, they were more likely to assert, uh, to assent to statements like, uh, if what, and this is a really interesting one, if what Jack did was customary in his culture, it would be morally right. So we got significantly higher assent to this, uh, these were all liquor did, of course, uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in the Asian uh, culture. Again, uh, we think that most of these results can be explained by the hypothesis that Chinese morality is more collectivist. The Chinese subjects are more tolerant of violence in response to anti-collective behavior, uh, in particular uh, the individual pursuit of sexual gratification at the expense of an important element of a central collective, namely the family. Now, if that's right, that is to say, if what's going on here is we have differences in moral judgments about particular cases uh, that grow in part out of uh, this very deep difference uh, <clears throat> between Chinese uh, or East Asians and Westerners uh, in the extent to which they conceive of a person as intrinsically a member of a collective as opposed to uh, as intrinsically an individual who may be associated with various groups, then uh, I think it's extremely plausible, uh, certainly not a knockdown argument, but extremely plausible that that disagreement is fundamental. Again, to see why, consider some of the standard diffusing explanations. Okay? Well, in particular, uh, first of all, we did ask uh, a bank of, for each uh, participant uh, and uh, for each scenario or vignette, uh, a bunch of uh, non-moral questions like what Casey did, what Casey and Debbie did cause Jack to suffer and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, there were no differences between uh, the, Eastern, uh, the, the Westerners and the East Asians, or the uh, Westerners and the Chinese on those questions. Uh, similarly, uh, it's hard to see how either group could be considered impartial or more impartial or less impartial on these kinds of things uh, since, after all, these are third-party judgments uh, where uh, it's hard to see that the participants making these judgments are uh, <clears throat> involved or impacted in any direct way. So partiality looks to be a non-starter. Well, what about rationality? Well, it's kind of hard to take seriously <laughs> the suggestion that one group or the other uh, suffers from significant irrationality, or uh, that 1.2 billion Chinese have corrupt minds, uh, as Ms. Anscombe apparently uh, is committed to claiming. All right, so those are our, not, <clears throat> I told you I was going to tell you about three uh, research projects. Uh, those are the projects. Uh, the data, I think, all pointing in the direction uh, of the conclusion that uh, moral disagreement is indeed fundamental, or at least much moral disagreement, or some, some important moral disagreement is fundamental. But uh, I want to turn now to uh, what I conceptualize as the yes but response, because whenever I give this material and have to stop at this point, uh, <clears throat> the first question is always yes but. Okay, and the yes but response uh, indicates that those who think there is little or no fundamental moral disagreement haven't been convinced. Uh, the skeptics typically focus, uh, appropriately enough, on details of the individual studies uh, and the kind of detail that most often is focused on uh, is uh, the suggestion that there may be uh, sources of disagreement that haven't been ruled out, most particularly uh, <clears throat> non-moral disagreement that could be lurking in the background here and uh, that could be causing the moral disagreement, non-moral disagreement that we haven't looked for just because there are, of course, basically an infinite number of places where that non-moral disagreement might be hiding. Well, what to do? Uh, in part, of course, uh, if for any given experiment somebody were to suggest a non-moral disagreement with a, uh, you know, a sort of strong intuitive plausibility, uh, any given claim like that can be tested. You do it over again and ask the subjects what they think about that particular non-moral claim. Uh, 
But I think the way to advance this debate, uh, I think, uh, so our work, the work I've just told you about, is of course in the Brandt tradition. Uh, it attempts to do a sort of philosophically uh, motivated ethnography. Uh, but I think there's a limit to how far that can be pushed in resolving the question about fundamental moral disagreement. Uh, what I think we need to advance the debate at this point uh, is two things. First of all, an empirically supported theory about the psychological mechanisms underlying the acquisition uh, and the utilization of moral norms, and a theory about how those mechanisms might have evolved. Uh, so if we can get empirically supported theories on those grounds, and of course if they uh, mesh with the kinds of findings I've just reported to you, I think that adds a very significant additional bit of uh, strength to the claim that there is fundamental moral disagreement on important matters. Well, as it happens, uh, Chandra Rapata and I have recently published uh, a theory aimed uh, at doing just that. Uh, there's the reference. There's a stack of books, which I'll be happy to say no. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, let, me, let me point out, however, that the, the volume uh, is the second of the three volumes from the Sheffield Innate Mind Project. Uh, third one will be out soon, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I guess next time I'll put in an ad for the other Sheffield project uh, because uh, we do hope to get as many people from <clears throat> uh, around Europe as possible involved in the Culture in the Mind project as it unfolds. All right, well, here is uh, the very simple, straightforward, and obviously true uh, uh, model that Srapada and I offer for the mechanisms underlying moral judgment. I'm not going to tell you a lot about that uh, since uh, the details and uh, the evidence for it is developed uh, at great length in the article I just referred you to. The article, by the way, is also available online on my website, so you, uh, you should buy the book, but you don't have to. All right. Uh, so uh, the model claims that moral judgments, those guys, are largely determined by uh, the rules uh, in what Srapada and I call the norm database and that what's in the norm database uh, is largely determined by the acquisition mechanism, which is, in turn, heavily influenced by the norms that prevail in the social environment that the person is embedded in. So, people who grow up in social environments where different norms prevail will often, according to this model, or if this model is correct, uh, will often make different moral judgments even in ideal circumstances. Uh, so a uh, core idea here is uh, what this thing is doing is by and large absorbing most or all or absorbing a filtered subset or a slightly distorted or corrected subset of the norms in the environment to which the agent is exposed. People who grow up in environments with importantly different uh, moral uh, norms are going to end up uh, with different norms in there, uh, and that will ultimately lead to different judgments. Okay, well, there's the model. Uh, Srupada and I survey a fair amount of, actually quite large amount of evidence, which we maintain at least uh, is consistent with the model. But uh, <clears throat> rather than to try to uh, give you a compressed version of that very long story uh, in the few minutes remaining, what I want to do uh, is to take up a a prima facie disquieting feature that the Srapada and Stitch model has, and that a number of people uh, have already pointed out. Namely, um, it seems to suggest uh, that reason or rationality plays at most a very peripheral role in our moral lives. And this isn't, uh, uh, <clears throat> I mean, that people think this about our theory is far from surprising since our theory uh, has been influenced by a lot of folks, but one of the people it's been influenced most by uh, is uh, the work of John Haidt, uh, which I'll be talking about, I guess, a little bit in the last uh, talk. Uh, but uh, John Haidt uh, notoriously uh, thinks that uh, reason uh, is uh, the tail that, well, no, is the dog that's wagged by the tail. I'm not sure how the metaphor gets unpacked. Uh, Haidt notoriously thinks that reason plays at most a very minimal ex post facto role uh, in the business of standard moral deliberation. And many people have said, your theory has similar consequences. Uh, 
and that's problematic for a bunch of reasons. Well, what I want to suggest is, uh, in the few remaining minutes, uh, that that in fact isn't true about our theory. Uh, I'll let Haidt, of course, speak for himself when he gets the chance. But to make the case, I'll rely on the work of Leland Saunders, uh, who's recently uh, published, I guess recently written, hasn't yet been published, a paper where he argues very interestingly and cleverly that it ain't true that in fact uh, the Sripada and Stitch model uh, actually supports at least one influential account of the use of reason uh, in moral decision making and moral deliberation. Namely, it supports, uh, indeed it naturally meshes uh, with a psychologized version of Rawlsian reflective equilibrium. So I want to tell you a little bit about this. I have to put in a, a sort of anticipatory footnote because in the last talk uh, <clears throat> next week, uh, I'm going to be saying some fairly negative things about Rawlsian reflective equilibrium. Uh, so I don't want to be interpreted as endorsing this as a way of uh, making moral judgments, but rather the dialectic here is, well, if you, like many people in the uh, philosophical world, think that Rawlsian reflective equilibrium, uh, <clears throat> when carried out uh, appropriately, gives you rational justification for both moral principles and moral judgments, if you think that's rational justification uh, <clears throat> and that that's a good thing, uh, that's certainly not incompatible with the Srapada and Stitch model. So let me tell you a little bit about how Saunders makes this case. First thing he says is, well, in order to use this cognitive mechanism that, uh, that we have sketched uh, to rationally justify a norm, uh, the first thing you've got to do is generate a lot of judgments about actual and hypothetical cases uh, in a given moral domain. And by the way, the philosophers, of course, are going to recognize this as a very, very common process uh, in philosophical reflection on uh, morality. Indeed, uh, back in the days, 10 or 12 years ago, when I every year used to teach applied moral issues, this is what we did in the, in the introductory applied moral issues classroom. Right? So the idea is uh, you consider a whole bunch of cases and let the system just make judgments about it. Okay, so you've now got a whole bunch of cases. Uh, <clears throat> and we'll talk about some of these again uh, um, uh, in the last uh, uh, lecture. Uh, things, you know, think of them if you want as trolley cases, if that means anything to you. Or cases about abortion or cases about euthanasia, uh, things of that sort. All right? Uh, well, what do you do next? Uh, the next thing you do is you articulate a moral principle or a set of principles that, where the goal is to capture these cases. That is to say, to entail that uh, these cases, given the surrounding facts, uh, will come out uh, judged the way you've just judged them. And as Rawls, of course, notes uh, when he talks about reflective equilibrium, uh, that will often require ignoring one or more of the judgments. It's often impossible to get uh, a coherent, simple, satisfying principle or set of principles that will capture all those judgments. And furthermore, the process is one that requires very explicit and often painstaking reasoning, as we all know uh, <clears throat> when we engage in this sort of thing in doing philosophy. So, uh, <clears throat> um, mostly because I found it fun to play with the PowerPoint, here's what that one looks like. <laughs> all right. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> Try to get a principle. When you get a principle, you're often going to have to get rid of one of the judgments. Third step. Well, the deliberative agent, now that he or she has formed a principle, uh, makes an explicit commitment, thinks to himself, this is a good principle. I ought to uh, behave in accordance with what this principle requires. Whoops. Uh, and that can be thought of. Uh, it's not entirely clear how to conceptualize a commitment in this model. But that can be thought of uh, as forming the belief, an explicit belief that one ought to behave in accordance with the principle. So uh, the principle then gets moved up there. And finally, uh, now that you've got this belief, how do you act on it? Well, uh, I think this is the cleverest part of uh, Leland Saunders' article. He says, uh, look, often when you're in that situation, you have a belief that you ought to act on a principle, but it's not a principle in your uh, uh, 
biologically given norm system, not what's in the norm system isn't biologically given, the box is biologically given, but it hasn't gotten in there yet, so it's not a, uh, he thinks of this in system one and system two terms, it's a system two entity, it hasn't made it into the system one part of the mind yet. Uh, well, what do you have to do when you're trying to stick with a principle that you are explicitly uh, uh, committed to? Well, you often have to explicitly rehearse the principle. Here's what I should do whenever the situation arises. You say to yourself, I ought or ought not to do A. And what's clever, I think, about Saunders' argument is that he points out there's a fair amount of literature suggesting that one of the environmental cues that leads to norm acquisition is the linguistic cue, uh, being told explicitly you ought to do this. It's not the only one, uh, but there's a fair amount of evidence that that explicit, explicit repetition of a norm, in fact, is one of the things that gets stuff from the environment into the norm box uh, in the Swapata and Stitch uh, mechanism. So, uh, <clears throat> Sometimes, at least, uh, after repeated um, articulation of the norm, the norm does, in fact, get, uh, or the principle doesn't get, in fact, get internalized. So the idea is this, uh, explicit verbal rehearsal, uh, and uh, that triggers the acquisition mechanism, and you get something in there. All right. Well, now where are we? He says, look, once you're in that situation, you've got that principle, which is, rationally supported now, uh, if you think the Rolzian, the Rolzian system is rationally supported, uh, 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 and uh, it will have the capacity to motivate behavior the way the system one norm system motivates behavior. Uh, so uh, what you'll have is behavior motivated by the norm system, uh, but driven by a principle which is itself rationally generated. Uh, so this is the last part of the story. Uh, that principle ends up uh, driving uh, uh, judgments, uh, and uh, mostly because I thought I'd need a glass of water uh, at this point. Uh, I, I've got a slide that says, well, uh, as Saunders points out, this is a very complicated and arduous process, so it's likely to be relatively rare. Indeed, it may well be that, for the most part, only philosophers or people heavily influenced by philosophical training engage in this sort of process. Uh, why is it hard and arduous? Well, here's where I get my water. <laughs> it worked. Good. Uh, okay, but uh, last thing to point out is, as Saunders does not point out, if you start with deliberative agents, so philosophers, if you want, who are going to engage in this kind of psychologized reflective equilibrium, and if they start with socially acquired norms, things that were in their norm box, as we call it, long before they got into the philosophy class or came upon this method on their own, uh, they start with different socially acquired norms, they're likely to end up with different judgment capturing principles, and therefore uh, with different rationally generated norms. Uh, so although we've got rationality in this Rapata and stage picture, uh, <clears throat> These people will be rational Rawlsian agents who nonetheless have fundamental moral disagreement. And that's it. Mm -hmm.